Touch me, I say! Master, that man was born blind. He's accepted his life the way it is. Why then change it? He lives in darkness. And as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. No, oh, don't leave my eyes alone. I don't want you to touch them. No, don't touch my eyes. No, oh, ah, you are hurting me. They're burning. What have you done to them? What have you put on them? Go and wash his eyes. Come on, let's take him to the castle. Come on. Wait, wait, wait. wait. Oh, good guy. Oh, 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 Come with us and see. The master has killed the blind man. Can you see? We don't know yet. Give him a good wash. He has to do water all his life. Go him in. Give him a good wash. <laughs> to say about the man who healed you he's a prophet there is no doubt what are you saying you got your sight back from god not from that man he's a sinner i i don't know i don't know whether he's a sinner or not i only know one thing i was blind i was blind before and now i can see <laughs> it's a miracle i must go to this man i must thank him for what he has done for me <laughs> Where is he? Where is he? know that he only pretended to be blind in order to earn his living. He's it's right, he's a liar. He's right. For a long time, he's never been blind. And what's your story? That you can give sight to the blind? I came into this world to give sight to those who cannot see. And to take away sight from those who can. What do you mean by that? 
that we who are righteous are blind. If you were blind, you would be without sin. But since you say we see, your sin remains. That's true. In chapter 9, Jesus healed a man who had been blind from birth. And now in chapter 10, as he's explaining what he did, he calls himself a good shepherd, the good shepherd who cares for his sheep, for blind sinners in need of a savior. As he explains it in chapter 10, verse 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. He says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Jesus is calling himself a shepherd. He's calling his people, his followers, sheep. He knows his people and they know him. They know that he is good to them. By taking on this role of a shepherd, Jesus is claiming to offer the same care to his people that God the Father does, 23rd Psalm. The first three verses of that say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. You look at those words, you see the sheep are dependent on their shepherd for everything, saying they cannot even lie down and rest without their shepherd. They need a good, kind, and merciful shepherd to guide them and direct them. They need a shepherd to keep them alive and well. And that is what the one true shepherd does for those who know him. Those who know Jesus can rest confidently in the fact that he knows and he cares for them. But where does this confidence come from? How can we be confident that Jesus loves us? Well, verse 15 tells us that the relationship that Jesus and believers in Him have, that relationship has its roots in the connection between Jesus and His Heavenly Father. The divine and intimate relationship between God the Father and God the Son should be the model for Christ's relationship with His people. He said He knew His own, His own know Him, just as in the same way, verse 15, the Father knows me and I know the Father. The way that God cares for Jesus is the way that the Good Shepherd cares for his sheep. If you are a Christian, there is nothing in your life that Jesus does not know about. He knows all of your thoughts, all of your feelings, all of your emotions. If you know him, he is always there for you. He knows you, he cares for you, and he is there for you. For those of us who claim to know Jesus, the closeness that Jesus experiences with his Father is to be a model for our relationship with him. So we should seek to grow that relationship by knowing God more and more. We can do that through reading his word, through studying it, through prayer, through worshiping together, and serving him with the rest of his people. I lay down my life for the sheep. 
he lays down, he sacrifices his life for his people. This means that the only way that someone can know God is because of the person and work of Jesus Christ. His death on the cross provides the only way for a person to have a relationship with him. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus says this, All things have been handed over to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father. No one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. So do you know Jesus? Do you have a relationship with the Good Shepherd? The only way is to turn from sin and to trust in this one shepherd, to trust in Jesus Christ. I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. Jesus says he owns, he has sheep that are in other folds. He's talking at the moment, these sheep are in other sheep pen, pens. They're away from him. When Jesus spoke these words, he probably had very few true followers, true disciples. Oh yes, there were crowds that gathered around him when he performed miracles, when he taught about God. But those who were truly committed to him were very few. And not only that, they were all from one people group. They were all Jews living in first century Israel. They were a small gathering from a small people group in a small country. But in this verse, when Jesus says he has other sheep, he is promising his disciples that there will be more. There are other sheep that he will bring into his one flock. There are other sheep who will have a relationship with him. Like his disciples, these sheep will hear, they will listen to his voice. They will turn from sin toward faith in Jesus. They will come to know God. They will obey his word. And this was promised in the Old Testament. The Lord revealed to the prophet Ezekiel that one day my servant David shall be king over them and they shall all have one shepherd. They shall walk in my rules and be careful to obey my statutes. Jew and Gentile. David said, all the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before you. David understood that God would provide a shepherd who would lead members from every ethnic people group to worship the Lord. Jesus is saying that he is the promised shepherd who makes one flock of God's people. Jesus anticipated Jews and Gentiles, people from diverse cultures, all coming together in one gathering under his leadership. The Apostle Paul would explain what this is in the book of Ephesians. He said, He, Jesus, came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him, through Jesus, we both, Jews and Gentiles, have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, you are fellow citizens with the saints, members of the household of God. If we know him, Jesus has brought us as sheep into his one flock. Jesus is the one shepherd. And the universal church made up of every genuine believer in Jesus, that is the one flock. That God's true people are not to be divided. God's people are not to be divided. Jesus has one flock, not many. Later in the Gospel of John, Jesus prays to God and he asks his heavenly Father to unite his disciples and to unite the disciples who would come later. He prays this, The glory that you have given me I have given to them for this reason, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one. Why is this important? Why do we need to be one? So that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you loved me. When Jesus' sheep are united, the lost and dying world can clearly see and understand the love of God. There are hundreds if not thousands of Christian denominations, all these different churches. What in the world does that have to do with one flock? That doesn't look like one flock. 
and I will grant you that there are definitely far more denominations than there should be. There's a church or denomination that affirms that salvation is solely through the work of Jesus and that it's coming from his authoritative word, well then we'll gladly consider partnering with that church, that denomination. But if they don't affirm salvation through Jesus, the importance of his word, then we will part ways. It was his own decision, a voluntary sacrifice. He chose to act in obedience to his heavenly father's charge or command. After all, he was the one who had the authority to lay his life down and to take it up again. God cannot be contained to a tomb, so neither could Jesus. Yes, the Jewish leaders arrested Jesus, the Romans crucified him, but Jesus was the one who laid down his life and took it up again. He died for sin, and now he calls us to respond. This man receiveth sinners, and eateth with them. What man of you, having an hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness, and go after that which is lost until he find it? When he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. When he cometh home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which I had lost. I say unto you, that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. Our shepherd takes the initiative in seeking the lost. So here's the thing to remember. Sheep are stupid. They will eat themselves to death and get themselves stuck with no way out. They need someone to rescue them. And in case you weren't sure, when it comes to the story of the lost sheep, we are the sheep. Isaiah 53 says, all of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own, yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. You see, God took the initiative while we were yet sinners and rescued us through his Son. Number two, our shepherd rejoices when the lost are found. When the shepherd finally finds the lost sheep, the Bible doesn't say he gets angry at the sheep or punishes the sheep for wandering off. Rather, he puts the sheep on his shoulders and carries it home joyfully. This is remarkable, of course. In the same way, there is more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and haven't strayed away. That's Luke 15 7. He begins the parable by saying, When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, He will sit on His glorious throne. This is found in Matthew chapter 25, verse 31. This gives an insight to the fulfillment time of the parable, which is at his return. All will be brought before the Lord, and he will separate them as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Let's take a closer look at this parable. The sheep and the goats are mixed together. They look very similar, yet the shepherd separates them. The center of this parable is the shepherd who is Son of Man, referring to Jesus. At the end of the time, he will be the judge. 
He knows the way that people have behaved here on earth and he is making the point that actions do determine our acceptance of salvation. Because we show what we believe by what we do. Our actions reveal the truth. We read in Matthew 25 verses 34 through 36. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. Just as you did it to one of the least these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Matthew 25 verse 40 What happens to the goats or those on his left? The king speaks to those on his left saying they are condemned and not allowed to come in. And he goes on to explain why. We read this in Matthew 25 verses 44 to 46. Then they also will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer to them, Truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And this will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. While goats can indeed perform acts of kindness and charity, their hearts are not right with God and their actions are not for the right purpose, to honor and worship God. In this parable, we are looking at men redeemed and saved, and men condemned and lost. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel, prophesy, and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God unto the shepherds, Woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves! Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? Ye eat the fat, and ye clothe you with the wool. Ye kill them that are fed, but ye feed not the flock. The diseased have ye not strengthened, neither have ye healed that which was sick, neither have ye bound up that which was broken, neither have ye brought again that which was driven away, neither have ye sought that which was lost, but with force and with cruelty have ye ruled them. And they were scattered, because there is no shepherd. And they became meat to all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. My sheep wandered through all the mountains and upon every high hill, Yea, my flock was scattered upon all the face of the earth, and none did search or seek after them. Therefore, ye shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, saith the Lord God, surely because my flock became a prey, and my flock became meat to every beast of the field, because there was no shepherd, neither did my shepherds search for my flock, but the shepherds fed themselves, and fed not my flock. Therefore, O ye shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will require my flock at their hand, and cause them to cease from feeding the flock. Neither shall the shepherds feed themselves any more, for I will deliver my flock from their mouth, that they may not be meat for them. For thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I, even I, will both search my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd seeketh out his flock in the day that he is among his sheep that are scattered, so will I seek out my sheep will deliver them out of all places where they had been scattered in the cloudy and dark day. And I will bring them out from the people, and gather them from the countries, and will bring them to their own land, and feed them upon the mountains of Israel by the rivers, and in all the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them in a good pasture, and upon the high mountains of Israel shall their fold be. There shall they lie in a good fold, and in a fat pasture shall they feed upon the mountains of Israel. I will feed my flock, and I will cause them to lie down, saith the Lord God. I will seek that which was lost, and bring again that which was driven away, and will bind up that which was broken, and will strengthen that which was sick. But I will destroy the fat and the strong. I will feed them with judgment. And as for you, O my flock, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I judge between cattle and cattle, between the rams and the he goats. Seemeth it a small thing unto you, to have eaten up the good pasture, but ye must tread down with your feet the residue of your pastures? 
and to have drunk of the deep waters, but ye must foul the residue with your feet? And as for my flock, they eat that which ye have trodden with your feet, and they drink that which ye have fouled with your feet. Therefore thus saith the Lord God unto them, Behold, I, even I, will judge between the fat cattle and between the lean cattle. Because ye have thrust with side and with shoulder, and pushed all the diseased with your horns, till ye have scattered them abroad, therefore will I save my flock, and they shall no more be a prey, and I will judge between cattle and cattle, and I will set up one shepherd over them, and he shall feed them, even my servant David. He shall feed them, and he shall be their shepherd, and I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David, a prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken it. And I will make with them a covenant of peace, and will cause the evil beasts to cease out of the land, and they shall dwell safely in the wilderness, and sleep in the wood. And I will make them, and the places round about my hill, a blessing. And I will cause the shower to come down in his season. There shall be showers of blessing. And the tree of the field shall yield her fruit, and the earth shall yield her increase. And they shall be safe in their land, and shall know that I am the Lord broken the bands of their yoke, and delivered them out of the hand of those that served themselves of them. And they shall no more be a prey to the heathen, neither shall the beast of the land devour them. But they shall dwell safely, and none shall make them afraid. And I will raise up for them a plant of renown, and they shall be no more consumed with hunger in the land, neither bear the shame of the heathen any more. Thus shall they know that I, the Lord their God, am with them, and that they, even the house of Israel, are my people, saith the Lord God. And ye, my flock, the flock of my pasture, are men, and I am your God, saith the Lord God. The greatest servants of Satan look like servants of God. They are wolves in sheep's clothing. Who are these evil enemies, these wolves ready to devour the flock? They are the holiest looking men on the face of the planet. They are religious leaders. They are Bible teachers. In Jesus' day, they were called the teachers of the law and Pharisees. And Jesus' teaching about them progresses throughout the Sermon on the Mount. At the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law are mentioned as standard bearings for outward righteousness. They have a form of godliness. As the sermon continues, we see how false that form of godliness really is. In chapter 6, Jesus refers to them as hypocrites, that is, they are masked actors. In chapter 7, Jesus speaks first in comical terms. They have planks in their eyes, even as they point out the specks in others' eyes. But then in verse 6, he sticks the knife in. They are swine. They are pigs. And you need to stop casting your pearls before them. They are unclean. They are excluded. They are the lowest of the low. But it gets even worse. Now, as the sermon comes to its conclusion in verse 15, Jesus says they are more dangerous than swine. They are wolves. Matthew 7 verse 15, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. And there's nothing more dangerous to sheep than a ravening wolf. A prophet is meant to feed the sheep with the word of God. False prophets feed on the sheep all the while masquerading as one of them. This is the chilling truth about the church's greatest earthly enemies. They come from within. The hypocrites wear a Christian mask. The wolves wear sheep's clothing. They appear innocent. They appear to belong, yet underneath there is devastating violence and murder. Imagine a wolf luring another sheep to itself, mimicking its mother's bleating. Imagine the sheep blissfully unaware of the danger. Now imagine the frenzy and the blood of a vicious attack. All it takes to tear a flock apart is for a false Christian to preach a false Christianity. How seriously do we take false teaching? Is it simply a doctrinal miscalculation? Is it merely damaging for the church's credibility? No, it's life or death. It's the wolves in sheep's clothing. Therefore, let's listen to the Apostle Paul's last piece of advice before he goes to be with the Lord. In 2, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, uh, here's the danger 
of wolves in sheep's clothing. Verses 3 and 4, 2 Timothy 4. For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. That's the danger. And what is Paul's solution? 2 Timothy 3 from verse 14. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus.